are in this series called This Is Us. We've been talking a little bit about family. We're kind of laying some groundwork even for 2018. We had Pastor Kevin up here a couple of weeks ago talking about some of the younger age kids and how we can have influence on them as adults. He brought out some pancakes, some bacon, and some Canadian maple syrup. I can't compete with that. Sorry, people. I just don't got it. He brought that stuff out here. Last week, Pastor Brinson came. He talked about the Apostle Paul and somehow ended up with Ric Flair from the WWE. So I don't know how he drew those conclusions, but it worked for him. Um, as we get into today's message, we're going to start to talk about what does it mean to be a mature spiritual adult? What does that mean? How does that look in our lives? How can we be mature as believers in Jesus Christ? I'm gonna bring in this analogy of a suitcase. I'll start to set it up now and we'll come back to it before we close today. But this is not original to me. I saw a pastor preach on this regarding family about 15 years ago and it really blew us away and we've always thought of it. And I'm hoping that if you're a parent, it really sticks in your mind as well. Be that in the natural or really in the spiritual. So the analogy I would draw for you is when you first get saved or when you have a child, life's like an open book, right? Everything's there. Whatever you want to put in it, you have an opportunity as spiritual parents, as parents in the natural, to sow into their lives and begin to make that difference and teach them about the things of the Lord. And then as they begin to grow up, you know, the the suitcase starts to close just a little bit more at each one of those stages of life as they're learning and as they're growing, all with the hope that one day they get out your house, right? You want to get them up out of your house and you want to do it in a very healthy way. And you hand them the suitcase and say, please never come back except when you bring the grandkids over to hang out. So we'll go back to that before we conclude a little bit and really try to round out that analogy in a few moments. Let's go ahead and pray and get into God's word today. Father, we thank you and praise you. We give you glory. You are our king. You are our Lord. You're the reason that we're here today. We can't thank you enough, oh God, for sending your one and only begotten son, Jesus, to earth to save us from our sins, to set us free, to live a life where we could serve you, love you, know you, and tell the world about you, would we do just that? Lord, for those of us who are in a place, really all of us who are here today, that need to make some changes in our life, Lord, would you touch us and do that which only you could do? For those areas of difficulty that we've not been able to overcome, Lord, would you move in those areas and bring us freedom? Would you cause us to fall more deeply in love with you than ever before? In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So at Journey, we have a saying, we want to be a church that's real, relevant, and enjoyable. It's part of who we are. It's part of our vision. So in an effort to be real today, um, we're going to share some things with you, even related to my own story in relationship to what Scripture says. And um, it's important that we do be real. That's what this life is about. What do we mean by that? We want to be a church where it's okay to not be okay. Did you get that? It's okay to not be okay, right? We're a church where it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay there if you're struggling. See, God loves us enough that he won't allow us to stay there. He will work in our life and put people around us and coach us and teach us and love us and guide us and direct us to change, to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's okay to be okay. You don't need to wear a mask when you come in. I have a great friend, they were walking up this morning, they were jesting, they were joking, but like the daughter was punching them in the arm and fooling around as they're walking up. I'm like, that's what it was like when you got in the car, right? You were in the car, you're all screaming at each other, punching each other, cussing each other out, and then you put on your mask when you walk into church, you're like, everything's okay, everything's fine, everything's wonderful. This is a place where you could take off your masks. This is a place where it's okay to be real. In fact, if you want to get help, if you want to change, this is a place where you should be real. It's a place where you should be allowed to be transparent. Far far too often in some church settings when somebody gets real and they share what life is really about, people jump on them and beat them up rather than loving them into life transformation. I pray none of you have ever experienced that at some point in your life, but it does happen. So we want to be a church that is real, a place where you do not need to wear masks, a place where we can get better together. And keeping with that theme, I'm kind of setting up for 2018 already. Our theme for next year is going to be found in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. It says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
that we would be a people that are free, that we would be a people that are whole in spirit, soul, and body. Can I get an amen? That's what next year is going to be all about, that we would be healthy, spiritual parents. So let me start off with a bit of a question today. How many of you would say that your family's kind of messed up? Those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're the one who's messing up your family. So you, everybody else around you knows that. It's okay. Guess what? You're not alone. I pray that one of the things that you'll see in Scripture today as we begin to read uh, what families there are in, in the Bible, some of them, I pray that you're going to draw a conclusion that your family's not all that messed up, right? As bad as you think it is, I'm telling you, it could be worse. Listen to some of the scripture that we're going to read here. In fact, you could jump right in in Genesis chapter 4, right from the very beginning. Listen to this story, Genesis 4.1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she con conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also bought the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If, it w if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door." The desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Your family might be messed up, but I hope nobody in here has deliberately went out to kill their brother. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> You thought your family was messed up, but hopefully nobody in here has done that, right? So you see this story right from the get-go in the Bible, and some of the ones we're going to read, there's a redemptive aspect in it. The person repents. They turn towards God, and God redeems them. Other ones, when you see it like here, in this case, Cain kind of hardens his heart, and things continue to get worse for him, right? So what you see in the beginning is it starts actually with a financial decision, right? He's giving an offering to the Lord, and finances have a way of revealing our heart, do they not? We don't like to think of them that way in some way, especially if you're sinning in this area of your life and you're not giving God your very best. But Cain is there, and Cain gives him a lame offering. He comes up to him and says, here, God, this is what I'm giving you, and God doesn't accept it, and God calls him on the carpet, did he not? He said, you can make this right. I love you enough. Will you make this right? You don't have to go on sinning. If you do, it's going to get really bad for you. It's going to overtake you. See, the finances revealed the condition of Cain's heart. And then God calls him out lovingly and says, please don't do this, reading between the lines. And Cain doesn't change. He hardens his heart in the situation. He's jealous of his brother. He's looking at his brother and his offerings and maybe his brother he perceived that was doing better than he was. And rather than rejoicing with his brother that was doing exceedingly well, he's jealous of the increase that his brother's experiencing. And all of this begins to stew in his heart. Rather than repenting when God challenges him to do so, he hardens his heart all the more and he ends up killing his brother. So you thought your family was messed up, right? But dig deep into that for a minute. Are there areas of your heart that you're hardening, that the Holy Spirit is talking to you and saying, would you change in this area? He's given you some rope. He's trying to help you out. He's trying to put you in a position where if you repent and turn from your sin and turn towards him, you'll find freedom. Don't be a Cain. Learn from his story and allow God to work in your heart and change you and transform you and forgive you. There's a famous line in there starting in verse 9. And the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? You see, the proper response should have been, yes, I am my brother's keeper. So when we talk about who we want to be as a church, I pray that that would be our heart. That we could be a people who are real, who could share our challenges and rejoice in our victories. We could love one another when people are doing well, and we could love one another when there's challenges going on in their life. That we would love people enough to call them out on their sin in a way of grace, 
where we would say, that's not God's best for you. God loves you. Don't go on doing that, where we would speak words of truth and life into them, even if it means that they momentarily hate us. Could we love people enough to share that kind of a thing with them, right? See, all too often we see other people around us in our life who we claim to love, and they're going on and living in sin, and we just ignore it, and we say nothing of it. You're giving them over to possibly end up in a place called hell. Do we love them enough to speak the truth to them? I pray that's the kind of church that we become, that we are a church that loves our brothers and sisters and would be there to be our brothers and sisters keepers. You get a little glimpse of God's heart, not that he is ever caught unaware, but when he looks at the sin that's going on in his life, he asks him, what have you done? What have you done? Might we think about that? May we never have to hear that in our own lives. Because I believe oftentimes God sets it up in our heart. We know right from wrong, right? He says God will never give us over to any trespass, so to speak, if we seek him first, right? So rather than waiting and hearing God say, what have you done? And then having to suffer the consequences of that fall, what if we went to him before and said, when we hear that still small voice and we're about to go out there and sin, and we turn to him at that part, Lord, help me. I don't want to do this. Lord, I want to serve you. I want to live for you. I want to glorify you. I want to bring you glory. Help keep me from my own self and my own sinful flesh and my own sinful spirit so that we never have to hear, what in the world have you done? May that be something that God never has to utter over our lives. See, God mourns over our poor childlike decisions. Move forward just a little bit. Let's go past that story. You don't have to get too much further in the book of Genesis to chapter 37. How many of you remember Joseph and his brothers and what they ended up doing? Anybody remember that story? He's loved by his dad and all of them are jealous of who he is and what he's becoming. And his brothers set out to kill him. You thought your family was messed up, did you, right? So they end up throwing him in a pit, if you remember the story, right? And then the pit wasn't good enough, so they ended up throwing him and sending him into slavery, right? You thought your family was messed up, right? Any of you ended up in a pit? Maybe you got your head stuffed in the toilet when you were a kid or something by your older brother. Maybe that, that, he wasn't trying to kill you. He was just being mean at that stage, right? But you see, in that case, what they intended for evil, God turned around for the good of those who loved him, and he used that as part of the story to position them where he would ultimately save his family and save the people of Israel by putting him in a position of authority in Egypt, right? So God can redeem stories. Joseph's heart somehow, in the midst of it, remained pure. He could have been angry the whole time. I hate my brothers. How could they do this to me? Why am I in jail? Why would they do such a thing to me? But somehow he knew that God's spirit was upon him and he turned towards God and the greater vision of what God had planned for his life rather than standing on and living out all those hurts and resentments every day. You know that hurting people hurt people? You ever heard that expression? Rather than living in that place, what if you forgave? What if you look forward? What if you pressed into what God has for your life? How different might your life look? Let's go all the way to the New Testament. Let's ramp it up and get there. It's Christmas time. How about the start of the Christmas story? Matthew 1.18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just and willing man and not wanting to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as she considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So even Jesus' very birth is birth in scandal, is it not, right? So how would you like to be Joseph going to mom and dad and starting to tell that kind of a story? Say, hey, I'm getting ready to get married. I think Tyler and Mahler are getting ready to get married in April. You know, Tyler's getting ready to put, put the ring, you know, officially on it, get married. And then all of a sudden, Molly's like, I'm pregnant. That would go over real well with the parents. Come on, Jesus, right? I mean, like, and then Joseph would be like, an angel came and the Holy Spirit talked to me and said that this is going to go. I'll be like, That boy's going into an insane asylum or something, right? I mean, do you see how this story is really awkward from the beginning, right? 
But God is a good God, and he loves us, and he came in a very unusual way. So you thought your family was messed up, did you, right? God loves you, and yes, all of our families are messed up. We all have issues. The choice is what do we do with them? How do we lead? How do we grow? How do we become an adult in the midst of these broken families that we live in? How does God turn these messes into something special and something beautiful? We named this series after the show, This Is Us. How many of you like that TV show? Anybody like This Is Us? Some of you? Y'all are heathens if you're not watching that show. No. I know Mary Jo loves the show. It's very popular right now. Um, one of the popular storylines or the more recent storylines uh, deals with Kevin. Um, he's one of the twins in the story or triplets, however, which way you want to spin the story. And his life is beginning to spin out of control. He finds himself uh, struggling with addiction struggling with fame, struggling with all of these different challenges that he's experiencing, and it's not going all too well for him. It's a story that I could relate to well. The family members around him love him. They don't know what to do. Everybody looks at him, and they want to help him, but he can't seem to help himself. You see, I was that guy at one time. I was the guy at the other end. I was the Kevin. 1996, that was me. My family around me loved me, and they wanted to see me get help. They wanted uh, hope to come into my life. They wanted to see me get free from addiction, free from the challenges that I was suffering and the pain that they were experiencing along with me. And God brought me hope. And maybe in that story, This Is Us, they'll bring Kevin hope at a future date. We shall see as the story continues to unfold, right? So if we were to get real about it, as a family, and I say this not so that you could, um, you know, maybe empathize with my family so much as my hope would be that if you're struggling, that it would give you the hope to continue to share and continue to go out and live your life in such a way that you make a difference in the lives of others. So this week was a challenging one for my family. In fact, the past few months have been a very challenging one for our family. My son suffers from drug addiction and alcoholism. He also has suffered for many years um, with mental illness. And uh, it's been a struggle since the time he was a teenager and the symptoms began to manifest themselves. It certainly gets worse when he's using. And, uh, you know, there's been periods in life where he's experienced great joy and great sobriety. Um, you don't see him around here much, right, because he's often struggling. There's been periods of time where he's been able to live on his own very successfully as well. And then there's been periods of time um, that have been extremely difficult. And we've noticed after the past couple of months that things seem to be continuing to get worse. Things seem to be deteriorating. And we've confronted him a number of times. And as you look at life and you look at family, for those of you who have family members that are going through these things, it's like an impossible situation. You want what's best for them. You hope that they see the light. You hope that they will grasp it. You hope that they will get it. You fear every day, are they going to turn up dead? They're not returning my text. They're not returning my call. What are they doing? Are they using? Where are they at? All these fears continually run through your mind. So we did as parents do at times, and we go show up at his house, and we confront him on situations, and he wasn't ready to change. He wasn't ready to do anything about it. And thank God this past week when confronted with the situation once again, he did agree to go to a treatment center. So he's there now. Praise God. We're hoping that he will continue on in that. So he, he's there. He's not happy. <laughs> you know, like, um, you know, so we're praying that he will be ready. That's something you could join us in, that you would pray that he would receive it. And as his mind continues to get clear, that he will begin to make the right decisions in the Lord, right? That the Lord would use this, that we personally don't believe, his, we, or we personally believe that the mental challenges that he has are drug-induced, that they seem to manifest themselves much more when he's using. So if he's clean, I think he has a great, great hope, hope for the future. So there's a pivotal date that's coming up this next weekend where he may have to leave where he's at and hopefully get into a longer term treatment and recovery program. Right now they do not have a bed, I don't believe, but we're praying that God will open up that door so he could stay and continually flow into that next stage. So we would ask you to agree with us in prayer over that situation that he would one, get sober and get clean, that he would fall in love with God all over again because we know he is a believer, but he struggled under the weight of this for many, many years. So we're praying that God will use this as that time to just reignite his heart and reignite the faith that is in there from the time that he was a child. And uh, I pray that you would join us in that. And again, I don't share these things so that you could really empathize with us so much so as I pray that if any of you are struggling, that you would have freedom in sharing it 
that we could be a church that's real, that we wouldn't jump on one another or look down on one another, but that we would care for one another and love one another and be there with one another. Rejoice again when people are doing well. Uh, help and be there when people are struggling. That's the kind of church that we want to be. So we pray that you would join us in that. Can I get an amen? Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So Kevin brought up this concept of life stages in his message, and I've often used it to also represent spiritual life stages. So um, as Kevin talked about the children, Brinson talked about the teens, uh, let's bring it back for just a moment to what does it mean to be a spiritual parent? So we'll go back to our suitcase for a moment. So you get saved. I would say this in those early days, it's so important to dive into the word and plug right in. You're setting the precedent for what your spiritual life will look like. Are you plugging into God's word? Are you diving in? Don't just be a passive observer of Christianity. Don't just come on Sundays, but be all in. It said, seek God diligently in the first scripture that we read, right? So when there's a child that's new, man, you go like with my grandson, Oliver, he's wanting to learn everything, he's exploring, he's touching everything, he's checking everything out, and a great deal of learning as a child happens very quickly. In fact, much of what you learn, probably by about the age of 10, you would think it's a linear process. Nope, by the age of 10, it's already like right here. You've already learned like 50% of the things that you're probably going to learn, barring being a new creation in Christ Jesus who could change them in the same way spiritually. If you set a precedent in your life, I'm going to show up to church when I want to, I'm going to come whenever I want to, and that becomes the basis of your Christianity, guess what? That's probably the results that you're going to get for the long run. So as you go on to those teenage years, it really is very formative in Christianity and in our lives as people, right? So what happens is during those teenage years, you think you've got a whole lot of space to continue to sew into their lives, but guess what? You don't because by the time they're 16, the, the suitcase looks like that. It's very hard after you start to become a teenager and move on to the next stage to begin to stuff information into there. They've already made their decisions. Their friends have influenced them. Their teachers have influenced them. Their parents have influenced them. Hopefully, we've been good influences on them. Amen, right? Train up a child in the way that they should go, and they will not depart from it, right? Even if they do, they will remember what it was like and hopefully come back to it. Can I get an amen, right? Amen. So we have these critical times and these critical stages where we as parents need to sow in the natural and spiritually because by the time they're out of high school, it's already there. And if you want them to go from there out into the real world to have a successful life, we've got to do a great job of discipling one another and caring for one another and being there for one another in the spirit and in the natural because, yes, we want them to leave the house and get up at Molly. Are you ready to go? Get up out the house. Go, go. She, <laughs> she came back of her own volition. She's been awesome. We appreciate it. Um, begged her to come back, actually. That was, yeah, that was awesome. So go live with Tyler. Come on, Jesus. You got a few months right there. That's for you. That's for you. Take that terrorist dog with you, too, in Jesus' name. <laughs> no, it's a great joy having her home right now. Great joy. But you get the picture, right? So you leave the house and you want them to go on. And then so they're entering into adulthood. What does that look like? What does it mean to be a spiritual adult? What does it mean to be a parent in the natural, right? So as Christians, we want to sow good seeds into the lives of the next generation, right? The gospel's only as good as the next generation. We need to put a big influence on whatever stage we're at, sowing into those who will come behind us because we want their lives to be a reflection of God's glory. So we need to show them the way. Are we going to show them some passive, laid-back, non-spiritual, non-spirit-filled Christianity? Or are we going to show them the love of Jesus Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit for the changing of lives? That's what we need to do. I pray as we exit this year and move into next, that's the kind of thing that we will put into practice in our everyday lives. And then should God grace us with enough time here on this earth that we have the opportunity to be spiritual grandparents all the more. What a blessing that is to see your children reproduce healthy spiritual children as well. Would God grace us with enough time here to see that happen? 
There's one verse that gave me a whole bunch of hope in what we read. Matthew 1.20. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear. Take Mary as your wife. He trusted even in the midst of this fear. Sometimes we're looking at life and it seems like everything's crumbling around us. Will you still trust God in that time? Will you trust him? He did, and watch what happens. For what was conceived in her is born of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus came to save us from our sins. In him, we no longer have to be like Cain. In him, we can be quick to repent. In him, we can be quick to forgive. In him, we can be quick to be agents of reconciliation, which is what Brinson brought up last week. He said it in the context of teens, but you know, you can be that in every area of your life. So I'd love to close by pulling out a verse that he shared with us last week. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16. From, that, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. If you look on the outside and you see all this pain and you see all the challenges and you see how they're manifesting, don't look at all those things. Look at what God wants to do in their life. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world unto himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and entrusting us with this message of reconciliation. Therefore, we, you and I, are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Jesus Christ, be ye reconciled unto God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God came to save us from our sins, and once we're saved, we represent him here on earth. We get to be agents of reconciliation to bring healing to our broken families, to bring healing to our broken neighborhoods. I pray we heed this call from Scripture, and we live it out in our everyday lives. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, I thank you for this day where we could be real, where we could share about our hurts and our pains, where we could share about and rejoice in the things that are also going good because I heard a bunch of good things from people this morning about awesome things that were happening in their lives as well. You are at work in this body here called Journey Church. And Father, I can't thank you enough for that. It is with great joy that I'm here before this congregation just saying, wow, look what the Lord has done, not what in the world have you done. Lord, you came to forgive. You came to set free. And maybe you want to do that just this very morning. Are you here today and maybe you wouldn't call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, but today you feel God's love tugging at your heart. If that's you, I want to pray with you in just a moment. I promise I'll do nothing to embarrass you, but I would love to pray with you. I would love to pray for you. For many who is, are here, I, I suspect that you're believers in Jesus Christ. But are there areas in your life where you're a lot more like Cain than you'd care to admit? Areas where you know God's been questioning you and God's been challenging you and God's been prodding you to repent of those sins and you've been holding on to them and you haven't allowed him to change you and you feel him piercing you this very moment and prompting you and challenging you to change, challenging you to repent, challenging you to allow him to do that which you could not do for yourself. Maybe there's some of you here that are in that boat today. I assure you that if you're a believer, that your salvation is secure. You can't lose something which was freely given to you. But guess what? Maybe you've been trying to do things on your own, and today's the day where you're like, God, would you help me? So is today a day where you need to dedicate your life to Christ or maybe rededicate your life to Christ? If it is, we would love to celebrate with you. Right now, nobody's looking around, and all heads are bowed, and all eyes are closed. Would you do me a favor? 
If that's you and you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to Christ, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand up really high so I could see it? I'd love to pray with you. I see your hand, young lady. I see your hand in the back, ma'am. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anyone else? I see your hand, sir, and your hand, ma'am. Thank you, Lord. If you raise your hand, would you do me a favor? I promise I will do nothing to embarrass you, but I would love to pray with you and for you. Would you be bold enough to get up out of your seat and come here to the front? I'll tell you what's going to happen. Everybody around you is going to clap for you. So if that's you, be bold. Come on up, brother. I'd love to pray with you. God bless you. So glad you're here. God bless you, man. Thanks for being here. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Come right up here. I know there are more. Come on up. God bless you. Thanks for being here. God bless you. Stand right here. We'll pray with you. God bless you. So glad that you're here. Welcome. Oh, yeah. God is good. Come on. Give him one more round of applause, Journey. Father, we just come before you, and uh, Lord, we thank you. We rejoice that you still save, you still set free, you still deliver, and you're doing just that today. You're saving lives, you're transforming lives as only you can do. Lord, we thank you that we're here for this moment with these folks who have come to the front just saying, Lord, we want to live for you, we want to serve you. We don't know how to do it in our own power, but Holy Spirit, would you flood into their lives with power to be successful in this life and beyond, Lord God. So we come to you in the same spirit, all of us today, just saying, Lord, would you forgive us? Lord, would you save us? Lord, would you set us free? Would you deliver us? Lord, we lay our sins at your feet and we ask you to remove them as far as the east is from the west. Lord, would you change us and transform us from this moment forward? We just declare with all our hearts, with all our strength, with all our mind, even as those magi did on that day and came and worshiped you, Lord, we say, From this moment forward, we will worship you with everything that is within us. Would you empower us to do just that? I pray for them and the many others who are here. If anybody be struggling themselves or their family members, Lord, I ask you to set them free this very moment. We mix our faith right now and multiply it in power and say, God, bring healing to the lives of the families of the people of Journey Church. Yes, our lives, our families might be a mess, Lord God, but would you turn them into a beautiful mess in Jesus' name? Lord, they are beautiful unto you. So we speak life and hope and freedom and forgiveness, not only into the lives of those who are here at the front, but into the lives of all of those who are part of Journey Church in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Give them one more round of applause. They've got some information they'd love to give to you before you go back to your seats, some next steps. Family members, they'll be there. Hey, this week coming up is Christmas Eve. You're not going to want to miss it. Bring somebody with you. We're going to be talking about traditions, and Mary Jo might even get up and do a little bit of the service, so you're not going to want to miss it. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. See you soon.